I think the 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 title is good because uh, I'm going to discuss situation where synchrony, and I think by synchrony we mean uh, synchrony between the patient and the ventilator. So situation where synchrony is good, but also situation where synchrony may be bad or harmful. Uh, so these are my conflicts of interest. Um, we all want ventilated patients to start as early as possible having some spontaneous breathing activity. I'm not going to go into details, but we have very strong, not only experimental, but now clinical data showing that uh, the diaphragm especially can uh, very rapidly go to atrophy if it's not used. And therefore, to preserve respiratory muscle function, uh, which will be important for winning, but also for long-term consequences, uh, trying to promote spontaneous breathing as early as possible is really something which looks very important. And there are also a number of uh, mostly experimental studies which suggest that uh, having spontaneous breathing activity um, diaphragm activity probably during uh, acute lung injury or ARDS, uh, improve VAQ relationship. So it may improve regional ventilation by reopening some part of the lung uh, close to the diaphragm or the respiratory muscles. And in this regard, we think that having a good vent synchrony between the patient and the ventilator uh, is probably something important. I listed some of the clinical issues where we think that uh, a good synchrony and a poor synchrony makes a difference. Uh, I sh will show very briefly one example about sleep in the ICU. Uh, the uh, synchrony may be important for respiratory muscle function because uh, otherwise the respiratory muscle may work in uh, situations where the uh, shortening of the muscles will not be at the same time that the increase in volume and that may not be good for the muscle. We have question mark about uh, the importance of synchrony in terms of comf comfort, need for sedation, but it may be something, uh, it may be playing a role there. Uh, and we have also examples where asynchrony um, makes more complicated winning assessment, which may explain the relationship between the uh, number of asynchrony and the duration of ventilation. Uh, and also another important aspect is that for a lot of asynchrony, we have tools to minimize this asynchrony. So it may matter, it's associated with duration of ventilation, and it's possible to minimize. But there are also possible uh, other possible situations, which I put on the other part, where uh, a good synchrony between the patient and the ventilator may not be desirable because it may simply amplify the transpulmonary pressure uh, swings, which may harm the lung, and it may also facilitate over assist, which is a very frequent event in the ICU. Uh, one example about sleep, very nice study performed by Sai Patasarati and uh, Martin Tobin. They compared during the night, the same patient ventilated with assist control for a few hours versus pressure support ventilation. Uh, you have all the typical recordings of uh, polysomnography with uh, EEG, uh, the um, eyes Act, um, motion, the, some uh, EMG recordings, uh, ventilation, SpO2, and EKG. Uh, if you just look at the pressure support part, you see that uh, when you look at the line indicating uh, VT, that there are frequent interruption in ventilation. And this is intermittent apnea, episode of apnea. And if you look at the top of the slide, you see the, the white bars indicate the arousals and awakening episodes. And what you see is that after each apnea occurring during pressure support ventilation, there is an arousal or awakening. So if you think 
that patients in the ICU are more or less sleeping maybe 18 hours a day. One of the reasons is that because their sleep quality is very, very poor, it's a very, very fragmented sleep. And here, there was a clear association between uh, an effect of the ventilatory support and the fragmentation, sleep fragmentation. On the uh, part indicating assist control, you see much less of this arousal, probably simply because there is a backup ventilation. Uh, when trying to understand what was the reason of this uh, episode of uh, apneas and arousal, uh, they simply added a third part to the uh, recording, which was adding a dead space to pressure support. And by adding dead space, of course, they increased PCO2. They did not induce hypercapnia. They probably normalized a hypocapnia, which was induced by excessive level of pressure support. And when doing that, uh, the number of arousal plus awakenings uh, decreased even more than with assist control, and the sleep efficiency increased. So very nice relationship between ventilator settings, patient ventilator interaction, and uh, a, a very clinically relevant outcome, which is sleep fragmentation and sleep quality. Uh, we also have data indicating that poor asynchrony, and this was a prospective observational studies we did in a group of uh, 60 patients uh, in the ICU, poor asynchrony indicated by a high asynchrony index is associated with a very, very higher um, duration of mechanical ventilation. You may say this is just an indicator of severity, but when you compare the tidal volume used in patients with high asynchrony, the pH level, the PCO2, you just see that these patients are hyperventilated. They have higher tidal volumes, they have lower PCO2, they have more alkalotic pH. So maybe suggesting that one of the reasons they have asynchrony is because we give too much support to these patients. And in fact, in a later study, we show that uh, in many of the patients, it's possible to reduce or to suppress a number of the, the asynchrony. And most of this asynchrony, as indicated on the tracings, were ineffective efforts, so patients being hyperinflated by the excessive level of assist we were delivering to these patients. Uh, and you see here that by simply optimizing the pressure support level in many patients, not all, uh, the asynchrony index could be markedly improved. No demonstration that uh, this changed the outcome of the patients, but a demonstration that it's possible to do something about this asynchrony. And this uh, nice study from Marshall and David uh, show gain of a very um, large difference in the duration of ventilation with or, with or without asynchrony. And interestingly, they used a multivariable model to demonstrate that uh, the presence of asynchrony was an independent factor associated with uh, long duration of mechanical ventilation. So in general, we, we, we do think that asynchrony is bad and that we try to reduce asynchrony, and, and I think it's, it's reasonable. However, and maybe uh, because the focus of this session is a lot about ARDS, we have something very uh, disturbing from the standpoint of trying to promote spontaneous ventilation and promote good synchrony. Uh, this study by Laurent Papazian showed that uh, if you give neuromuscular blocker, so if you completely shut off spontaneous breathing during the first 48 hours of ARDS, uh, you're not only uh, showing that there is no harm with uh, neuromuscular blocker, but you're showing an improved outcome an improved outcome by suppressing spontaneous breathing activity. And uh, the reason for that are not exactly clear, but very likely this is due to the effect of uh, 
maybe an excessive level of spontaneous breathing activity or maybe this synchrony between the patient and the ventilator. So you see very nice hypothesis on this cartoon, which indicate the, the, uh, what can happen without paralysis and the usual mechanism for inducing ventilator induced lung injury because we think that what we see with neuromuscular blocker is less ventilator induced lung injury and ventilator is probably not the good term because part of it's it's in fact ventilation a part coming from the ventilator a part coming from the patient so i would say for the clinician that's really difficult because there is one day where we have to stop paralysis and uh, so i'm not i'm not saying from this study that we should give paralysis to every patient all the time, or every ARDS, but we need to better understand what's happening. And in this situation, when you decide to stop paralysis, you cannot continue for long, or when you decide it's not needed, uh, to choose the right mode of ventilation, which allow correct gas exchange, to protective lung ventilation, but allow some spontaneous breathing activity, that's very difficult. And in this instance, uh, it's important to come back to the basic principle of the modes of ventilation. For instance, if you think about volume control ventilation, uh, I indicated here the, uh, the airway pressure and the esophageal pressure, so the red arrow would be the transpulmonary pressure, the difference between the two. In volume control ventilation, uh, the advantage of this mode is you control volume, which means when the patient is spontaneously breathing, we say triggering the breath, uh, the transpulmonary pressure will not change. And that's why you see fluctuation in the airway pressure. So, the advantage of volume control is that you control the volume, so you control the transpulmonary pressure. However, very often that's not very comfortable for the patient. And this is the main reason why we switch to pressure control or pressure assist control ventilation. But in this situation, if the patient is taking larger effort, the airway pressure will not change, but the difference between the airway pressure and the esophageal pressure will increase, therefore the total transpulmonary pressure will increase. So with, with pressure control ventilation, any form of pressure control ventilation, uh, you do not control transpulmonary pressure. So again, very difficult choice, a mode which is more comfortable, but where you have less control of transpulmonary pressure. And we have a number of modes which make spontaneous breathing feasible, easy, without inducing a lot of alarms on the ventilator, uh, and which are called by many different names, but they're all pressure-targeted modes. And the main characteristic of this mode is that the expiratory valve is always open. Always open means that at any time during the high pressure or the low pressure, spontaneous breathing is possible. So like CPAP, but at two levels, and you can use this mode with uh, pressure, mandatory pressure breath sufficient to ensure gas exchange, plus time for the patient to have spontaneous breathing, either during the high pressure or during the low pressure. In this situation, however, the, the, the ventilator company so that it would be better to synchronize, and we come back to, the, uh, to my topic today, to synchronize patient's effort with either the increase in pressure or the decrease in pressure. And this is a very uh, classical uh, technology for ventilators. They just have a, a window during which they wait for a signal coming from the patient, and when the signal comes, they deliver the breath at the same time. And the same can be done for expiration. So most of the modes of ventilation using pressure-targeted uh, objective uh, have this synchronization. So if you, 
carefully look at all the pressure preset mode, pressure targeted modes, uh, you can find one mode where there is no synchronization. This mode is called APRV. And this is very confusing because APRV is usually uh, used with a very long, uh, not inspiratory, but high pressure time and a very short release. There are modes where you have partial synchronization, let's say SIMV pressure control, uh, where you can or cannot add pressure support during the uh, uh, low pressure level. And you have modes which are the most frequently used where every breath is synchronized with the patient effort like pressure control assist or pressure support ventilation. Uh, and just imagine again something very simple. This would be the tidal volumes that you would set based on your initial pressure control level. And you, you would set six milliliters per kilogram at every breath. So this would be a patient without any spontaneous bleeding. Let's now stop paralysis. The patient starts to breathe at his own rhythm. And let's say he's not doing strong efforts, but maybe efforts sufficient to perform tidal volume around 4 ml per kilogram, because every effort will be synchronized with the ventilator uh, mandatory breath. Then every breath will be now exactly the same setting, but the patient is breathing. Every breath will be at 10 ml per kilogram. So maybe the best solution, again, for the compromise between lung protective ventilation and some spontaneous breathing activity would be to have no synchronization at all. No synchronization, which would mean that you would have a lot of small breaths, maybe 4 ml per kilogram, which would not participate to gas exchange, but that's not what you want. You just want some respiratory muscle exercise. Uh, some breaths where the, the, the mandatory breaths of the ventilator will deliver 6 ml per kilogram and some, a few breaths where the two will come together uh, and, and give 10 ml per kilogram. So in this situation, the protective lung ventilation on average would probably be achieved, uh, but with a much higher variability than in the two other situations. Uh, in this study published in Intensive Care Medicine, and Jean-Christophe Richard was the first author. Uh, this was a bench study where we simulated patients' uh, different kind of inspiration. We had always exactly the same pressure settings on the ventilator. And you see, uh, starting from a non-synchronized mode, which is a PRV at a standard setting of pressure, uh, uh, inspiratory and expiratory time. Uh, and going to a partially synchronized mode like SIMV or personally, uh, partially synchronized mode SIMV plus pressure support or a fully synchronized mode like uh, assist control or pressure support, you progressively increase tidal volume and you progressively decrease variability. So if you think that uh, protective lung ventilation with a small tidal volume and with some degree of variability is, is maybe the best option, you would prefer to use a non-synchronized mode. And again, the, the difficulty is that the only way to do that is to use this mode called bi BiPAP Air PRV, uh, which does not exist on all ventilators. Uh, but to use it exactly with the settings you, you would use with the pressure controlled ventilation, so not a long, high pressure time. And this would be an example of a patient you see all these small breaths, and at, at a normal respiratory rate, uh, mandatory pressure at, the, uh, uh, at the, the, the level needed to give 6 ml per kilogram would be given. Uh, this is the way you can monitor the amount of uh, minute ventilation. So you have the difference between the total minute ventilation and the spontaneous minute ventilation. And these are data which were obtained in patients. Uh, and just separating the different uh, period of time in, uh, with regard to the amount of spontaneous activity. Sometimes the patient is doing 50% of the total minute ventilation, sometimes only 10%. Uh, 
And you see that on average, the tidal volume is uh, in the range uh, expected, so delivering protective uh, lung ventilation. Uh, and the coefficient of variation is relatively high, so at the same time you do protective lung ventilation, you also have a, a high variability. Uh, these are three additional patients where we compare the three modes, AP, uh, APRV, uh, SIMV pressure control, called I, here BiPAP, and assist pressure control, and we had exactly the same result. We just finished uh, a larger study where we enrolled 15 patients, and we are now also looking at the effect on the worker breathing of these patients. So uh, the optimal mode of ventilation, allowing spontaneous breathing, uh, is not something simple to define. It may very well depend on the stage severity of respiratory failure. In the early phase, control ventilation, maybe with neuromuscular blocker, may be, may be needed to be absolutely sure that you uh, deliver lung protective ventilation. Uh, I don't know when I put 48 hours because that was uh, done in uh, Papazian study, but maybe earlier. Uh, we should start with some spontaneous breathing activity and at that stage I think that a non-synchronous pressure targeted ventilation, APRV without the classical settings of APRV may be the best uh, compromise and later on uh, a synchronous pressure targeted ventilation like pressure support may be used. But probably the best response uh, if uh, these modes uh, would be uh, in, uh, for clinical use would be also to add a monitoring of what the patient is really doing using either the esophageal and transpulmonary pressure, either the electrical activity of the diaphragm. Stop there and be happy to answer any question. Thank you.